Greetings and welcome to lecture number two on our unit on ancient Rome and the origins of Christianity. This lesson talks specifically about the time period after, after the Republic of Rome, getting us into the actual empire and empiric rule during Roman history. Basically, this takes place right around uh, 50 BC into the 150s AD, give or take. So remember, while we're doing this, make sure you have your Lecture 2 worksheet with you and are filling it out as we go along. As usual, if you have any questions, please make sure that you speak with Mr. Vincent and feel free to pause the video as needed to get all the information that you need. So let us begin. A Republic Becomes an Empire Setting the Stage With the defeat of Carthage and the Punic Wards, Rome was pro proving to be the biggest and most powerful civilization on the Mediterranean. The larger Rome's territory got, the more unstable the republic form of government became. As the territory got bigger, it got harder and harder to rule. You have all these people that are way out, away from the center of Rome, all these different provinces away from Rome, and the further they got, the bigger problems they had. And this is typical of a lot of uh, empires and countries as well. Even the United States and sometimes in, in past. In the end, the Republic collapses. Rome's increased wealth and expanding territories brought problems. Discontent among the lower classes and the breakdown of military order was two of the main reasons why the Republic collapsed. The lowest and the poor were having problems, we'll talk about that in a minute, and the armies and the military were not following orders, were not doing what they were told to do, and were not being really well trained anymore. Again, they just got so big. SPQR, that's actually a fr Latin phrase that means Senatarius Populisque Romanus, meaning the Senate and the people of Rome referring to the ancient Roman Republic and used as the emblem of modern-day Rome. This is the phrase or the abbreviations they used during the Republic, signifying that Rome was a Republic, it was ran by its people. Now we are in that transi transition of this changing. Economic Turmoil The gap between the rich and the poor widened. The rich liked living on their huge estates or their very large houses and properties, where the poor worked on these estates, possibly even as slaves. So they might not have been considered slaves, but they kind of worked as though they were slaves in some cases, or paid very little. By about 100 BC, one-third of Rome's population were enslaved. So for every nine people, three of them were slaves. That's a pretty large number of slaves, and the more slavery or poor people you get, uh, with the fewer leaders you get, or the, the fewer upper class, you're going to get a widening gap between the two and a lot of problems between them. We're even seeing that today in the United States. Military upheaval. Generals seized power for themselves as they, time went on. They wanted more power and ended up trying to take control. In order to get soldiers for their cause, these generals recruited by promising land to different people, whether they were the poor or the slaves. They would say, hey, if you work for me, you give your trust in me, I will give you land, which was certainly a big deal back then for a lot of the poor who didn't really have land. Citizens loyal to the generals rather than Rome itself, which is a big transition. Typically, Romans would be loyal to the city, to the country itself, not to an individual. Because the generals wanted power and because the generals were promising something that the city wasn't, the poor and the slaves would take up the generals on their offer for this opportunity to get land. In comes Julius Caesar, about 60 B.C. He joins Crassius, who was a rich, wealthy Roman, and Pompey, another popular general, to create 
a triumvirate. Triumvirates was simply a group of three rulers, and they ended up ruling together for ten years. Now, there's a couple backstories that go along with this. Julius Caesar was very popular, which we'll talk about momentarily, but in order to get the backing of the majority of the people, this was a strategy that worked because it kind of split the power between three people, which made the Roman citizenry uh, feel more comfortable than it being in only one per po and power in one person. In the end, this would change later on. So here we have kind of a brief description of Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus, and how they worked together. In the bottom, you can kind of read that each together brought something to the table. Caesar led the populars, Pompey led the Optimians, and Crassus, the richest man in Rome, led the Equites, merchants class. Caesar sealed the deal by giving his daughter Julia in marriage to Pompey. So this three pieces of leadership each had their own uh, strategies, their own way of leading, but also their own benefits to one another. Caesar takes power. Caesar has success in Gaul, which is today's France, and becomes quite popular. Political rival, rival Pompey urges the Senate to disband Caesar's legions. They're worried that Caesar, as a general, would take his army and take over the leadership of Rome. And he had some reason to be considered or concerned about that. Because Caesar ends up defying the Senate's orders and marches into Rome. Pompey, who was the leader at the time, flees Rome, obviously scared over Caesar's army. Caesar ends up defeat by defeating Pompey's troops in Greece, Asia, Spain, and Egypt. Julius Caesar ends up returning home in 46 BC, and the Senate appoints him as dictator. Only two years later, in 44 BC, Caesar is named dictator for life. Even though Caesar has total control, Rome still embraces some of its republican roots. However, it is moving closer to empire. So here we see Caesar, the first dictator of Rome, kind of this beginning of the transition from the Republic of Rome to the dictatorship of Rome, or the Empire of Rome. He's the beginning. Caesar, or Julius Caesar, could not just make the switch overnight. He had to kind of wean his way into it. Very political, very mythological, uh, but, but, uh, using methods and strategy, but eventually he gets that power. His legacy. He was the absolute ru ruler, but he also expanded the Senate allowing more people to be on the Senate uh, so people's voices are heard. This also makes him look good because it says, hey, I might be in control, I might be the absolute ruler, but I'm not ignoring the people. He also granted citizenship to people in Roman provinces. As Rome conquered more areas, he would give these people citizenship, which is not so much a new thing, but it made him more popular. He helped the poor by creating jobs and building projects. The easiest way to get people to work back then is to build something. So they would build all these new projects, roads usually, uh, particularly. Uh, this gets people jobs, gets them working, and the people are happy when they're working because they get money. He also increased pay for soldiers. This again was a, a piece of strategy that Caesar used in order to keep the troops in his control. If the troops are happy, if they're getting paid, if they're getting what they want because of the Caesar, they're going to be happy with the Caesar and back him up. So this is, this is a political move in order to make sure he holds on to his job um, as long as he can. However, many nobles and senators expressed concern over Caesar's growing power, success, and popularity feared losing their influence. They were worried that he was getting too popular. And just like a lot of these Caesars, they or the other a lot of the rulers, people don't like one person having power or the appearance of too much power. Others considered Caesar a tyrant. 
that he had total power and he could do anything he wants and nobody could stop him. Many felt Rome would suffer due to his ego in the long run. As things progressed, uh, many senators were feeling he was getting too popular, he was going to get too much power, all total power, including senatorial power, was going to go to him, and uh, some senators were not uh, liking that idea. In the end, Caesar was stabbed to death in the Senate by a gang of senators led by Marcus Brutus and Gaius Cassius on March 15th of 44 B.C. Brutus actually being one of his best friends. And here's kind of an image illustrating the murder of Julius Caesar on the Roman floor. Such things uh, are remembered with Julius Caesar. Obviously, uh, Caesar salads, for some reason. Caesar's palace in Las Vegas. Obviously, all these images uh, because of him and his rule. But after Caesar, along came Octavian. And here's kind of a picture of him. Octavian was Caesar's 18-year-old nephew and adopted son. He takes power with Mark Antony and Le uh, Lepidius and creates the second triumvirate. Octavian forces Lepidus to retire eventually, Mark Anthony falls in love with Queen, Cle Queen Cleopatra of Egypt. So here again we have his triumphant, or these three leaders, controlling Rome. The importance of knowing this, that Octavian forces Lepidus to retire, and Mark Antony falls in love with Cleopatra, starts creating this discontent between the two remaining leaders, Mark Antony, oh, sorry, between Octavian and Queen Cleopatra. And here again we see kind of a little description about this triumvirate powers of Mark Antony, Octavian, and Lepidus. And you can read that on your own if you choose. It gives you some interesting information there. Octavian eventually accuses Antony of plotting to rule Rome from Egypt, and this leads to another civil war. Again, this is probably just a strategy used for Octavian to get soul and total power. If he gets rid of his rivals, he's the only one left, and he rules. Octavian defeats Anthony and Cleopatra's forces at a naval battle of Actium in 31 BC. Mark Antony and Cleopatra commit suicide, leaving Octavian the sole ruler. I guess it was probably better for them to commit suicide or be executed. Uh, Octavian ends up taking the name Augustus, meaning exalted one, in 27 BC. Now we're going to briefly take a look at some of these Roman empires that were considered the best uh, by many accounts. So again, we're talking about Octavian here. Octavian was really considered the f or was considered the first true Roman emperor. He's the first one that had sole power that he didn't have to share with anybody else. The Senate named him Augustus, meaning revered personage or exalted one. He ruled from 27 BC to 14 BC or 14 AD. So he ruled for about th almost 30 years. This was the guy that was in charge during the beginnings of Jesus Christ, incidentally. His rule ended several years of civil war, was not interested in dictatorial rule. He ended up sharing power with close advisors. Even though he was the one that made the decisions, he let others help him lead with their knowledge. Successfully discharged soldiers, reducing the army, he still kept 28 legions for auxiliary strength. He didn't want to make it look like it was a military state, but he also knew that you needed military. So he got rid of a lot of soldiers, but kept some there just in case. He ended up dying of an illness August 19, 14 AD. Another popular Roman emperor was Vaspian. He ruled 69, 69 to 79 AD, worked hard, lived in a stable relationship with a woman he loved which was very odd. Typically, emperors liked having lots of women, um, and it was done for political reasons, not so much for love. Uh, he was considered a first-rate soldier, very smart and very knowledgeable. 
He built the Flavian Amphitheater, later, later known as the Colosseum, which is what we call it today. He did die in 79 AD before the completion of the Colosseum. He died about a year and a half to two years before the Colosseum ended up opening, unfortunately. Trajan, if you recall from our video, he was mentioned um, in that video. He ruled from 98 BC, sorry, 98 AD to 117 AD. He built the form, or the new form, which we'll see in a moment, and created extensive restructuring of the Circus Maximus, the great arena for chariot races. Uh, he had a great reputation for, for being very effective. He expanded Rome militarily, but in the end he fell ill and died August 9th, 117 AD. Trojan was very loved. He liked building, but he was more interested in renovation and reconstructing, making things function the way they were supposed to function. Um, he did do some creation of new things as well, but uh, he didn't want to really do so much expanding as much as holding on to what he already had. And here's kind of a, an outline of the forum that Trojan created, much bigger than the original form. He got several temples, for example, one on the side here, Temple of Peace. On the other side, you've got the form of Augustus, which was kind of like uh, a public arena. Uh, you got a Temple of Mars right there, another form. Basically, all these different places, and again, these, where it says forms, these are where places could people could get together and talk and discuss the issues that were going on publicly. Granted, it is under an imperial rule. People were still allowed to speak their mind. And obviously, on the, to on the top here, you've got Trojan's Market, like the mall as well. Um, more temples down here. Temple of Romulus. So, back then, religion and government worked hand in hand. Um, you Actually, you were expected before a meeting of the Senate, which still existed, uh, to be praying to the different gods uh, for strength in government. And a model, which we've kind of seen before, of Trojan's form, much bigger. And this is only a part of the form. This is just the centermost piece of the form. Here you've got, in the back side, those shops, the main form here in the middle, uh, a temple right there on the top left there. So... In the middle was this tar large column known as Trojan's Column, and it depicted his success in Dacia, which is basically the wars that he fought, uh, the civil wars that he fought. And this is just a story from the bottom going all the way to the top, leading or showing the story of his battles. And this is what's left of Trojan's form today. Originally, this area was actually a mountain that had been dug into. And again, if you review the movie that we watched um, the other day, this goes into more detail about that. But this is what's left of it. Um, all right. And back to some of the other emperors. we got Marcus Aurelius. He ruled from 161 to 180 AD. Very gifted general, expanded the empire. Philosopher, a very smart guy. He did fall ill and died on March 17th, 180 AD. And right at his death, the, emperor be the empire began to erode under his son Commodus, and leading to the end of Pax Romana. And there, here's a depiction of him, Marcus Aurelius from the movie Gladiator. Um, this is the basically the end of the high point of Rome's successes. Result, Rome is officially an empire because of the battles of that guy again, Marcus Aurelius. Did a lot of conquering, expanded land very much, but again, this is the end, the, 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 the beginning of the end for the strength of the empire. He was the last real guy that kept it all together. At Rome's peak, between 27 BC and 180 AD. That period of time was known as the Pax Romana or the Roman Peace. 
During this time, the entire empire's population was between 60 and 80 million, with about 1 million leave, living in the city of Rome. Rome was held together through efficient means of government, started by Augustus. However, many terrible emperors would gradually weaken the empire over the next 400 years. Common coinage made trade easier. Because you've got one massive empire, all trading with one another, there needed to be a common usage of money. So they standardized the coin, so no matter where you went, the money was good, and it was equal, let's say in France, as it was in um, uh, Atola, for example. The money was good, it was the same value no matter where you went, everybody understood it, similar to the United States today. Uh, during these times, uh, there's a phrase that ended up coming up. Uh, you might have heard of it. All roads lead to England, or uh, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, the Romans built about 250,000 miles of roads. Um, so many roads, the phrase came, all roads lead to Rome, because they created just so many roads. Another phrase, when in Rome, do as Romans do. Um, you might have heard that phrase, however, not so much for this movie, which was kind of stupid in my opinion. The Republic becomes an empire still. 90% of the population were poor, and slavery was common. The Colosseum was used to distract the masses because of much uh, the city was unemployed. Uh, gladiator battles were popular for entertainment. However, the rich continued to live extravagantly. Um, at the Colosseum, people could go, wasn't a big deal, uh, didn't cost a lot of money, so anybody could really go and afford it and see and have a good time while they were there. But it kind of, unfortunately, was just a temporary fix. Uh, it got people in the right mood, happy, they're seeing this, they're having fun, but it was a shadow of the real problems going on during the time period. And once again, we have a picture of the movie Gladiator, which does a pretty good job of talking about that time period um, and what it was like to be a gladiator in the arena. And here we have just a coliseum at Caesar's Palace, Las Vegas. Um, so... Even though these empires are long gone, they still left their mark on. Finally, coming up in our next lesson, the works of Jesus of Nazareth and Christianity would forever change the world, even into today. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. If you have any questions, feel free to ask Mr. Vincent. If you need to go back and review any of the materials, feel free, and I look forward to seeing you guys in class. Have a great day.